Good afternoon. We're going to continue our program with our luncheon speaker. We uh, thank you, whoever that was. Uh, we, of course, celebrate another important anniversary today, uh, which is would good to, to note, which is that in 1796, on this day, George Washington released his farewell address, uh, in which he announced his retirement, gave his advice on constitutional government, religion and morality, and America's place in the world. Uh, often misunderstood, uh, that address was actually about how America should steer clear of permanent alliances, but at the same time develop the wherewithal, the strength and consistency to give it, humanly speaking, the command of its own fortune. So it's appropriate today that we conclude our discussions with a consideration of America's foreign policy. Uh, during the election, uh, Donald Trump campaigned about with the idea of reshaping American policy to place America and its interests first. Uh, in Warsaw, Poland, again in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and I expect uh, today when he speaks to the United Nations, we will hear more of that. Uh, Sebastian Gorka served most recently as deputy assistant and strategist to President Trump. Prior to working in the White House, he held the General Horner Chair of Military Theory at the Marine Corps University and was Associate Dean of Congressional Affairs at National Defense University in Washington, D.C. Uh, he was born in the United Kingdom uh, to parents who escaped communist Hungary. He served as a reserve member of the British Army's intelligence and security group and now is a United States citizen. Uh, he appears frequently in international media, uh, BBC, Fox, CNN, C MSNBC, and Breitbart, among others. And he's the author of a New York Times bestseller, Defeating Jihad, The Winnable War. He's speaking today on American greatness and an America first foreign policy. Join me in welcoming Sebastian Gorka. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Never go anywhere without your copy of Imprimus. <laughs> okay. um, it really is a, a high honor for me to address this august audience. My wife and I have been uh, huge fans of Hillsdale uh, for many, many years, and it's always a race when Imprimus hits the doormat, who's going to read it first? So, um, but I have a caveat to begin with. For the next 30 minutes, Please don't expect a discourse on de Tocqueville and the epistemology of the new age. <laughs> My first degree was philosophy and theology many moons ago, but I cannot match the erudition of the panels that we heard this morning. I'm going to bring it all down to earth and share with you uh, my experiences inside the belly of the beast as a deputy assistant and strategist to the president and uh, how we should move forward and what we can expect in the years to come. But first things first, I must make a plea to all those people who came up to me last night and have done so since I left three weeks ago. Relax. <laughs> Take a deep breath and count to 10. The fat lady isn't singing. Okay, I know that's not politically correct, but who cares? Um, we are in this for the long game. I'm going to you know, be using uh, Washington jargon, but this is about the long game. It's not about the first eight months. It's about eight years and then another eight years under President Pence. That's the plan. Lots of people got suicidal when my boss, Steve Bannon, resigned. And then they really got suicidal when I left the building. But it's okay bringing us back to the principles of the founding is not a function of where Steve sits or whether I have a window in my office in the Eisenhower building. It's a function of the ideas that brought a man, as we were reminded last night, brought a man who has never held public office before or been a general or flag officer 
into the position of being the most powerful man in the world. There is a reason for that, and it is much bigger than the few people who work in that wonderful people's house just across the city. So, hold the line. Um, the only philosophical thing I'll say uh, is words matter. Words matter. And the words for my address today are simple ones. The first one is a phrase, common sense. The second one, which is allied to common sense, is the word truth. And the last one, which is the most important, important philosophical undergirding of everything that brought Donald Trump into the White House and informed his policies, is the word sovereignty. This is missed by the people inside the Beltway. These aren't random speeches. The war, defeating ISIS, pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord. These are informed by the same philosophical idea, the importance of sovereignty and the nation state. So that's all the philosophizing I will do. So uh, let me talk to you about my experience uh, uh, for the last few months inside the White House. Um, I'll talk about three things. Who is the president? Uh, I'll talk about what happened inside the building. And I'll address this question that has become so popular today of the deep state and how it affects foreign policy going forward. Who is the president? The president, behind closed doors, is exactly the same as he is in public. He's not your average politician who, when he sees a camera, flicks a little switch in the back of his head and then switches on that Washington grimace. He is who he is. When I first met him in the summer of 2015, when I was asked to come brief him in New York on matters to do with national security, the man in private was exactly the man I'd come to know on the television screens. And that is, in itself, refreshing. There is no Janus-faced bipolarity with this individual. Secondly, he is a preternatural instinctual actor. It is not an exaggeration. Uh, Monica Crowley described him most accurately. The weekend of the election, we were with David Horowitz and his colleagues at his uh, restoration weekend, which was either going to be a wake or a celebration. Um, but the right candidate won. And two days after the election, uh, Monica stated, the people who misunderstand Donald J. Trump look at him through an ideological lens. And that is completely the wrong way to look at him. Because Donald J. Trump wasn't an ideological candidate. He was an attitudinal candidate. And that is very, very much so. You cannot slap easy, lazy labels onto this man. Yes, the chattering classes would have you do so. The mainstream media would have you do so. But remember, this is a Republican candidate who strode along the campaign platform waving a gay pride flag. That's not exactly a classic Republican candidate. He breaks the conventional taxonomy, and that's important to remember. What he is is a man who cares about making this nation great again. That slogan is not pablum, it's not empty rhetoric. He truly wishes to translate what he has done in the private sector in terms of making a great brand and translating that back to America's position in the world and its founding principles. What happened in the last seven months until I left the White House? Um, well, what happened on January the 20th needs to be understood. Who likes the movie Red Dawn, the original one? Great movie, okay? Those of you who have not seen it, watch it. Not the remake, the original. On November the 8th, it was very much like the movie Red Dawn. A scrappy band of insurgents won against the behemoth. And in this case, it was the establishment. Donald J. Trump was only accidentally the GOP candidate. 
he was as much an anti-establishment right-wing candidate as an anti-establishment Democrat candidate. He was the antithesis of the swamp. As a result of wiping the floor with 16 candidates, think about that, wiping the floor with 16 establishment candidates, and then trouncing a woman who had spent $700 million for a position she thought was owed to her, as a result of that unprecedented political event, on January the 20th, or the 21st, 8 o'clock in the morning, when we rolled into the West Wing, it was a hostile takeover. And it has to be understood as such. If you look at the federal government, if you add in the armed forces, we have two plus million employees. And a couple of dozen people who are committed to the platform, came in to execute a hostile takeover of an institution with literally millions of employees. That's not going to be easy. As such, we fought a rearguard action inside the building. And at one point, for Steve, uh, it was earlier than me, he decided he can be more effective on the outside. He took his decision. And then when I heard the president's speech on Afghanistan, I knew it was time for me to relocate my desk and my chair. I came in because of my background in counterterrorism and my commitment to defeating radical Islamic terrorism. And when a speech was written for the president, which had that phrase removed after its use multiple times in Riyadh, in front of the joint session of Congress in Warsaw, I knew that the swamp was in ascendance. However, very important to remember, this is a temporary state of affairs. I predict that in the next few months, we shall see some very significant changes of personnel at the highest levels of the administration, not because a cabinet member decides to do it or a chief of staff, but because the president decides to do it. In the last seven months, most of the firings have had nothing to do with the president. In the next few months, I predict they will, and that is a good thing. Let's talk about the deep state. I don't like the phrase the deep state. I think it has a, 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 a flavor of a conspiracy theory. Um, I love conspiracy theories as fiction. <laughs> okay, I have a bookshelf of them, but there's a reason they're called theories. They're not conspiracy facts. Okay? Um, I prefer the phrase the permanent state. And that's not a conspiracy theory. The permanent state is real. And it is a problem when you look at the values that it holds. I wasn't part of the National Security Council, but I, thanks to some good people in the NSC, I attended numerous meetings on key issues whether it was the Qatar crisis, whether it was defeat ISIS, Muslim Brotherhood, and so forth. And to sit, I mean, look, I'm the child of people who escaped communist dictatorship. My father, at the age of 20, was given a life sentence for being an anti-communist and spent two years in a prison coal mine. So I arrived to Washington with a sense that I was adequately cynical. I had no idea. When you sit inside the Situation Room, or you sit inside an NSC video conference facility with members of the interagency sitting at the table, and then outstations, DIA, uh, CIA, Department of Defense, so on and so forth, and you're talking about a very important policy issue. At the highest level of US government, policy coordination inside the NSC, and you just listen for an hour, hour and a half, and not one person in the room or on the outstations mentions the name of the president, what his objectives are given the relevant issue, or what he said yesterday in Warsaw, we have a problem, Houston, especially when you see that happen again and again and again. And then it's left up to me, the guy with the funny accent, 
to remind everybody in the room and on the outstations, you do know what the president said yesterday about ISIS, or you do know what he said yesterday about illegal immigration. The lone voice uh, had to remind them. That's the permanent state. It's the GS-15 who's been at the State Department for 20 years and thinks he knows better than the individual who was elected to run the federal government. This is something that will take years for us to rectify, but we shall. Second topic I'd like to talk about is based upon what I heard yesterday. You know, you always plan great speeches and then you hear people like Professor Ahn and then you have to throw it all out and start again. So I'd like to address what the good professor said yesterday about war and the great lessons we must learn from true statesmen like Churchill. Statecraft is dead. We haven't had statesmen or women since the 1980s as far as I'm concerned. I grew up under Maggie Thatcher. She was a hero to me, uh, as was the Gifford. Um, let's just ruminate for a moment on, on this word war. War is not a word you wish to use lightly. Churchill was absolutely right. But we must differentiate between different types of war. We are not in a total war. We don't have children today collecting al aluminum soda cans so we can build bombers. That's total war. However, however, there are people who are engaged with war, in war, with us right now. And that's, to begin with, irregular warfare. What groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda are doing on the streets of Boston, on the streets of Nice, on the streets of Orlando, is a form of warfare. It's not total war in the Clausewitzian sense, but it is war. And one of the reasons I decided to uh, assist the president was in the first five minutes of meeting him in 2015, I realized that this is a man who understands we are at war with a new totalitarian enemy. Global jihadism is a form of totalitarianism. It has a connective tissue, it has a shared gene code with the fascists and the Nazis of the past, with the communists of the Cold War. Why? Because you cannot negotiate with Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi just as you cannot negotiate with Hitler. They will either kill or enslave you, period. And when I met Donald Trump, I understood immediately this is not only a man who understands we are at war, he also wishes to win that war. And that is very refreshing. But there are other forms of warfare we must be familiar with. There is political warfare. And there is information operations. And we are being targeted right now. I'm not going to get into, you know, the Russia collusion delusion. But the fact is, or what, what does my friend Kellyanne call it? The Russian concussion. Um, but the fact is, anybody who is surprised that Russia wanted to influence an election in a Western democracy has been asleep since 1917. That's what the Kremlin does. And the fact is, Russia has um, fine-tuned the tools it developed during the Cold War, which were called maskirovka, desinformatia, and it is using them today in the cyber domain. This isn't about Hillary. This isn't about Podesta. This is about Russia's tradecraft for the last, what is it, 100 years, the anniversary this year. And we must take it seriously. We don't. We, we, I can't tell you how many meetings I've been through in the Pentagon where when you say the word political warfare, people get all jittery. I mean, we did this. The OSS wasn't a special forces organization. The OSS was a political warfare organization. We need to understand who's using it against us and to respond against it. And then lastly, the thing that ha the scales fell off my eyes uh, during my months in the White House, thanks to Steve Bannon, because what I learned about economic warfare. I was brought in to talk about counterterrorism and represent the president uh, in the media. But if we have a long-term threat to this nation, it's not the jihadists. We will deal with the jihadists. They will be no stone upon stone left eventually. What we have to understand is what China is doing to us in the economic domain. 
and the rank abject surrender that our private sector, especially Silicon Valley, and many politicians in this uh, city have demonstrated by saying, oh, Chinese money, that's like anybody else's money, that's fine, their money's green too, wrong. When Apple decides to put its latest artificial intelligence research center in China, that means China has successfully executed economic warfare against us. And we need to take this seriously. If you don't believe me, after this event, go home and Google one phrase. One belt, one road. One belt, one road. The Communist Party of China looks at the last hundred years as the anomaly in more than 5,000 years of history. They see it as an embarrassment and that it will return to its rightful place as the hegemonic power in the world and it has an overt plan to do so. It's not classified, Google it. One belt, one road. They know how to do strategy and they are executing on that strategy and the sooner we wake up, the better. So, where does that leave us with regards to future foreign and national security policy? Well, number one, <laughs> we must remind ourselves that Francis Fukuyama was very wrong. When uh, that former neocon wrote, I think it was in 1991, a famous book that turned into an article, The End of History and the Last Man, his argument was a very seductive one. We defeated all the totalitarians. We defeated the fascists. Well, now we defeated the Soviet Union. Therefore, uh, the future of mankind is determined. It was actually quite a Hegelian argument, yes? It was the, the natural progression of the dialectic. He said the future of mankind is, I'm going to date myself here, is simply a question of twiddling with the buttons on your graphic equalizer of democracy. You're just going to have to high tune the bass, the treble, and, and it's, there's no serious threats. We've defeated all of them. It's just about fine-tuning. His argument was, ideology is dead. That's what we were told in 1991. Ideology is dead. I ask you today, if you listen to the president's speech that he gave an hour ago at the UN, if you look at North Korea, if you look at Venezuela, if you look at Iran, if you look at Russia, and tell me that ideology is dead, then I'll check whether you've got a heartbeat and whether you're breathing. Ideology is reborn, not in a bipolar sense, but there is a connective tissue that links Venezuela to Iran, to ISIS, to Russia, to China. They're not all communists, they're not all jihadis. But their one ideological connection is that they all wish to de undermine or destroy us. Iran, I, I totally agree that the threat from North Korea is a very serious one, as we heard last night. But Iran is more serious. Why? Because our last administration facilitated a regime that wishes to destroy us. $150 billion signed a deal that doesn't stop them getting nuclear weapons. It mildly delays them. To quote a survivor of the Holocaust, an old man who'd seen his whole family die in the labor camps and in the death camps of Auschwitz and Birkenau, some facile reporter asked him one day, what is your take home from the last six years of, of the Holocaust? What's, what's your big lessons learned? Oh, he said, oh, that's easy. There's one lesson learned. When a group of people repeatedly says they will destroy you, sooner or later, you should take them seriously. We need to take Iran seriously. And everybody else who not only verbally is committed to our destruction, but is working on ways to acquire the capability to affect that destruction. So, we need to understand that on the right, we have been far too superficial in our understanding of foreign policy. For in the run-up to the election, the reason I actually agreed to work for Donald Trump additionally was 
I've had enough of people saying on the right, you only have two options when it comes to national security. You must be an isolationist like the libertarians, pull down the shutters on the Pacific coast, or the Atlantic coast, and we'll be fine, just like we were in Pearl Harbor. And the other option is, oh, if you don't want to do that, if you want to be a libertarian, you've got to be a dastardly neocon and invade everybody's country and create democracy at the end of a gun barrel. Well, there's a massive scale in between. There's a massive palette of true statecraft between isolationism and neoconservatism. And that's who this president is. I have been in the Oval, I'm not talking out of school, but when the president tells me one-on-one, -on -one, I do not wish to go to war with Korea, that's reassuring. He understands the consequences of his actions. But at the same time, when he sees men and women gassed to death in Syria, he's prepared to take action. We didn't talk about red lines, we didn't bloviate, we acted. And the day after that attack, I bumped into the vice president as, as I was coming out of the West Wing, and he stopped, and he said to me, the day after the cruise missile attack, well, first thing he said to me was, what do you think about last night, go Navy? <laughs> seriously, he said, go Navy. And then he said, very seriously, so what do you think? Do you think they got the message about gassing unarmed women and children? And I said, yes, Mr. Vice President. I think the world got the message. Strategic patience, leading from behind, created a Dantean inferno across the globe, which we inherited. We understand it's not about reckless application of force, but use of force when it is needed, but only in the national interests of the United States. That's what America First means. I commend to you, I know the individuals who wrote it, if you haven't closely done so, please go back to the President's Warsaw speech, because the President's Warsaw speech is a reaffirmation of Judeo-Christian civilizational values and a statement that we will not expect fought by force our political system, but we will stand shoulder to shoulder with anyone that shares our Judeo-Christian values, whether it's Poland or whether it's Belgium, anyone. That's who the president is. The impediment along the way is the managerial elite. That's the biggest obstacle. That's the technical term for the swamp. They have a default ideology which is really anti-national sovereignty, cloaking itself in postmodern sophistication. Organizations like Hillsdale can pierce through that ideological default setting and remind us of the existence of objective truth, which I think is the basis of why blue collar steel workers in Youngstown, Ohio, who were registered Democrats, voted for a billionaire from New York. They may not know the difference between Sunni and Shia, but they know that something is rotten in the kingdom of Denmark, and therefore they voted the way they voted. We have to return to true statecraft. I'm very excited about uh, what I heard yesterday, the masters in government that Hillsdale will be pursuing. Because to quote one of our greatest presidents for the time we are living in right now, as our case is new, so we must think anew, Abraham Lincoln. We must think anew because this city is as intellectually bankrupt as it is morally. If we do so, then we let me quote from Primus. A speech by a certain presidential candidate, who's now the commander in chief. What is needed in Washington is a president who will reign in the executive branch and work with Congress to make sure the legislative branch does its job. That is Donald J. Trump's objective. And if we help him to be successful, if Hillsdale can help him to be successful, if the graduates sorted across the administration can help him to be successful, 
then we will be able once more to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our prosperity. Thank you. Dr. Gorka has some time for some questions. We do have microphones. If you would raise your hand and direct them towards us, that would be wonderful. Sebastian, great speech. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, I do have uh, one question which is still unresolved in my mind, is that why, I mean, uh, I would, feel, I would feel safer if you and Banyan were in the White House and the GS-15s who have been in the federal government for 20 years are not in the White House. It seems to me things are somewhat uh, reversed. And I don't quite understand why the guy who has the power to hire and fire and certainly doesn't know the meaning of the word fire, uh, 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 why the GS-15s are still there. And you're not. I, I, I still don't get Look, that. Look, so first things first, does anybody think that the President of the United States deals with HR actions for GS-15s? I mean, I mean, come on, common sense, please, right? The President deals with cabinet members and then signs off on people that are assistants and deputies. The idea that the President is going to go through with a, you know, a, a broad brush and, and sweep out the detritus of the permanent state is just fallacious. I mean, this man has enough on his plate already. Um, but let's talk about Steve Bannon and myself. When, when Steve resigned, I was on vacation when he resigned, um, of course the left was just you know, coruscating excitement across off the left. I mean, they're, they're holding parties into the, the wee hours that Steve Bannon had left the White House. You do realize that once Steve Bannon resigned, he became the most powerful man in America outside of the West Wing. You do know that, yes? I mean, the left has no idea what they're talking about. The idea that he's unshackled from the requirements incumbent upon a U.S. government employee. I mean, if I got three TV interviews in a week representing the president, that was a good week. The day after I resigned, I had 20. Yes, I mean, this is, this is the reality. There are things you can do, legal things, lest politicos listening. There are things that you can do outside of government that you simply cannot do as a politically commissioned officer of the president. So the president reached out to me the day after I resigned. He said, thank you for your work. He said, I am going to stay on my agenda. I would like you to support me from the outside. And that's exactly what I am doing and Steve is doing, with a far larger palette of tools available to us than if we'd stayed in the building. And I predict, and look, it's not, it's not about me or Steve going back into the administration, I predict in the months and years to come, you will see people who have been indelibly identified with the president's original victorious message who will be coming into the building. Not only that, the fact that individuals like Corey Lewandowski, David Bossy, were walking in and out of the Oval Office freely, I mean, they didn't work for the government. Who do you think, what do, what do we think they were talking about with the president? The weather? The president is very loyal to those who have been loyal to him. So again, deep breath, count to 10, it's okay. <laughs> Dr. Gorka, thank you so much. So I did a little research. My numbers may be off, but bear with this and you can and then elucidate. So in 1800, the first census, there were um, 8.3 million people in the country, mm -hmm. 125 people in the executive branch. <laughs> fast forward to, you know where I'm going with this. You fast forward to 2015, if I remember the numbers right, population is like 320 million, uh, so it's 53 and a half times the original population. The administrative state, the uh, executive branch was uh, 2.9 million, so that went up 21,200 times to the 53 times the population. Right. How do we, how are we ever going to, I mean, I, I, I have patience, it'll take time, yeah. but we always hear, uh, we never hear about this thing decreasing. I think the president tried to cut EPA and stuff like 30%, but who knows if that'll get through Congress. It's always like, it always grows and it grows and it grows. How does it stop? 
Yes, all, all those government agencies that are going to dissolve themselves. Yes, there's a great history of that. Um, yeah, your, your point is well taken. Uh, Eisenhower, I, I hate the, the, this, this idea that you hear all the time in, in the war colleges and across you know, the think tanks. The world is so complicated today. It's so much more complicated than anybody ever had to deal, deal with before. I mean, do we really think the president in 1948 had an easy time? We just lost, lo losing China, Berlin blockade, 60 million people killed in World War II. The idea that just because you have an iPhone, the world is more complicated is, again, bad thinking, okay? Um, Eisenhower's National Security Council, Eisenhower, not a calm time in history, was 25 people. We inherited from President Obama an NSC of 420 people. So yes, uh, a lot of work has to be done. But individual, I, I'm not going to give away names here, but in the, watch in what individual cabin, cabinet members are doing. Individual cabinet members very quietly are doing very interesting things at, at the less sexy portfolios. That will tell you the commitment to taking on the administrative state, but you are right, it will take time. Thank you. You mentioned the problem of Apple moving operations to China. Yes. What can we do about that? Uh, don't buy an iPhone. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, look, uh, in my book, Defeating Jihad, um, people always ask me, so what can I do? What can I do? I mean, I, I, I never in, you know, enlisted. Uh, I can't teach at a war college. Can I do anything to help? And I say, absolutely. The first appendix in my book is what you can do in the war against the new totalitarians. And the first thing you can do is educate everyone around you. Don't just wait for Hillsdale to do it. I mean, at the water cooler, at the, you know, the, the 4th of July barbecue in your, in your neighborhood, educate people on the reality. Uh, my friend in the White House coined the, the term fake news industrial complex. And it's a great phrase. I mean, I thought I, I was adequately cynical about the media. I had no idea. I spent just seven months in office. One journalist, one journalist alone wrote 45 attack pieces on me. One. They attacked the reputation of my dead mother. They attacked my wife. They attacked my teenage high school son. This is what we have to deal with. So you have a massive role to play in cutting through that, not by getting preachy or standing on a soapbox, but when somebody says, the Russian, the Russians, and all this about Trump, just ask them, so what exactly? Are you talking about the 20% the of the uranium that Hillary agreed to sell to the company that was giving her husband a $500,000 speaking fee? I mean, that Russian collusion? Are you talking about the DNC sending an operative to the embassy of the Ukraine, not just to collect filth on our campaign, but to coordinate an attack against our campaign? You mean that collusion? Just help push back on the lies, on the spin, on whatever topic it is. If you have a passion for economics, do it in economics. I mean, a million jobs have been unleashed in just a few months. Yeah? I mean, can, can, you, can we remember a Nobel laureate, a wacky left-wing Nobel laureate, predicted that if Donald Trump wins the election, I mean, this is just ontologically insane. He said, the stock market will suffer a crash it will likely never recover from. <laughs> Sorry? What? Never? What, you mean we stop selling shares? How does that work? Never recover from. What are we at? The 29th stock market record for the Dow? Historic record, not since January, since we've been counting. That's how bad Donald Trump is for the U.S. economy. And, oh, well, that's about rich stockholders. And say, no, 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 it's about your 401k. That's how you push back. Anybody who's got a pension fund, what happens on the Dow is good for you. You don't have to be the CEO of IBM. It's good for all Americans. And this is something I learned from working with the man. And you can't convince through personal experience, but perhaps I can share with you my understanding, and perhaps through osmosis it will bleed through. 
This man, A, number one, this is very important, this man does not have a racist bone in his body. Donald J. Donald J. Trump, hand on heart, give me a Bible, I will swear in it, does not have a racist bone in his body. The idea that we are the anti-Semites, we are the racists, when his grandchildren are Orthodox Jews, is an utter outrage. Thank you. Help us to push back on these smears. Secondly, and this is from personal experience, this man, because of what he believes in, in what we are as a nation, he wants every single American in our great nation to thrive and prosper. Even if you voted for Hillary, he wants you to thrive and prosper. He's not vindictive. He believes that everybody's boat can rise. It's not as American greatness is not a zero-sum game for the president. And that's, a, that's an important bumper sticker kind of level message to get out there. So please, help us. Yes? Um, would you elaborate a bit on the relationship with Russia? Specifically, mm -hmm. does your view, does your call for a new statecraft include the possibility of tactical alliances here and there with Russia? Okay, so what is Russia? Russia, great not to be a government employee. Russia, um, there was the last press conference, I think it was the last press conference the president gave in Trump Tower. Uh, do you remember when he, I think he handed over his company to his, his children? And as he was leaving the press conference, somebody from the peanut gallery shouted out, what about Putin? What about the Kremlin? Uh, the Russia mania was beginning. And the president stopped, looked at the journalist, and gave the best two-sentence answer on the White House and Russia that was true then is true now and will be true for as long as he is the president. The president replied, in theory, I would like to have good relations with Moscow. Right now, hmm, doesn't look too likely. If that is the case, so be it. That's it. End of story. The president is a patriot and a pragmatist. He is the melding of those two things. So he says, I would like to have better relations with Russia. Why? Because they have 5,000 nuclear warheads. Open a atlas. There are very few geostrategic nations in the world. Russia, by dint of its location and size, is a, a nation of geopolitical and geostrategic import. Not to have good relations with it is unwise. He said many times, we are not interested in having new enemies. However, however, in the coal, uh, uh, the coal light of day, its actions with its neighbor, Ukraine, its actions in propagating disinformation and misinformation at a grand scale means that it will be difficult, if not impossible, to have better relations with them. Why? Not because they're an existential threat to America. I mean, think that Russia loses 600,000 people more each year than are born. I mean, they lose a large city who die, you know, with, with you know, cirrhosis and you name it, than are born. It's in, a, it's in a demographic death spiral. So it's not an existential threat to America. It is a spoiler. It is a spoiler. And it is an anti-status quo actor. The president would like to have good relations, doesn't look likely. If that is the case, so be it. Nothing more, nothing less. Excellent question. Thank you. One more question? Yeah, to keep on track with our schedule, this will be our last question of the yes. day. Good. Rick Roos, Indiana. Uh, I told you privately I appreciate the fact that you, do, you don't buy the premise most of the time of the drive-by media, and I really do appreciate that. But as far as the vindictiveness, people have committed crimes that they aren't being held accountable for, including the nominee of the Democrat Party. Mm -hmm. uh, my boys all went to Hillsdale. They learned about justice. It does not seem like justice is being done by the fact the FBI is inept or corrupt, and the DOJ 
right now just doesn't seem like, you know, we'd rather investigate the Russians than people that actually, Lois Lerner, uh, the former head of the IRS, I mean, they're guilty, I think, but doesn't seem like anything's happening. I know I'm in flyover country, but, you know, I can still read the paper. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Rule of law is crucial, absolutely. Um, I, I can't go into details, but there are, at least when it comes to what was my primary concern after the administration was the national security leaks, we have close to two dozen criminal referrals uh, that the DOJ is currently handling. So that's not bad. That's not bad. So again, patience. I know we all want to see, you know, bad people get their just desserts, but there is a system. We must follow the system. And Attorney General Sessions is a serious man, and things are in the works. We shall see. But stay the course. Thank you, uh, President Ahn. Thank you, everybody.